What we're going to be discussing in this video is the three tables that EIGRP uses, the neighbor table, topology table, routing table, and how those work together. How EIGRP goes about finding neighbors to exchange routing information with. Loop avoidance with a successor and feasible successor route stored in the topology table as well as dual diffusing update algorithm that EIGRP uses. Now EIGRP is a hybrid protocol meaning it has some characteristics of both link state and distance vector routing protocols. The big drawback to EIGRP is it is a proprietary protocol Cisco only. So if you have an all Cisco environment it's going to work great, easy to configure, less overhead than OSPF, more scalability than RIP and IGRP. However, if you're in a multi-vendor environment you're not going to be able to use it. The first thing I want to talk about is how EIGRP goes about populating its routing table. It keeps three tables, a topology table, a routing table, and a neighbor table. Now the first table it's going to want to populate is the neighbor table. This is number one. That's got to come first. And what EIGRP does is it sends these hello packages out every five seconds on a LAN interface and a point-to-point -point WAN link. So this would be five seconds going here, point-to-point -point WAN link, as well as every five seconds going out its LAN interface. Now there aren't any other routers coming out of this Ethernet Zero interface, so if we wanted to, we could prevent EIGRP from sending information out of the Ethernet Zero interface using the command passive interface. And what it does is it prevents EIGRP from establishing neighbor relationships on Ethernet Zero. But it would still listen for information. But it's not going to establish any neighbor relationships here, so it won't exchange any information, anything like that. And we would like that because there aren't any routers on this side of router A. We'll call this router A, we'll call this router B, and we'll call this router C. Now, what will happen is if this was on a multi point WAN link, like a frame relay link it would send hellos out every 60 seconds. So it would slow them down a little bit in a frame relay environment that was a multi-point WAN link. So here's a router connected through a frame relay environment. Multi-point mean one router connecting to multiple other routers. In that environment it would send out every 60 seconds. So what happens is the hellos allow EIGRP to establish relationships and what they're looking for basically is IP connectivity dot one dot two IP address here so 99.32.01, 99.32.02 same subnet mask that's got a match and then the big thing is the autonomous system number we'll say the autonomous system number is 100 as I said in an earlier video the autonomous system number is simply an administrative control of routers. So if we had a bunch of routers on the public domain we would have what's called our own autonomous system and we would actually get an assigned autonomous system number. In a private environment EIGRP still needs to know what routers it wants to share information with. So if I were to give this router, router A, an autonomous system number of 100 and router B an autonomous system number of 110 or anything other than 100, they would not exchange information. So that allows me to kind of control what routers my EIGRP router is going to share information with. So in here, if I want them all to talk, everybody has to have an autonomous system number of 100. They will establish them as a neighbor, so our neighbor table, they'll get populated in the neighbor table, and then they will do a full topology change. If we look down here, full topology change, then update messages to a multicast address. So the first thing they do is they do a full topology change. And they'll look for the best cost path. And then what's called the feasible successor, which would be the second best cost path. And we'll talk about that in a, in a moment. But the key thing is they establish their neighbor relationship. 
They do a full topology table change. That's the second step right there. Then, based on that topology information, they put the best cost path in their routing table. That's the third step. But the big difference between OSPF and EIGRP is this topology table. It only keeps minimal information in the topology table as opposed to everything. Let's take a look at what information actually gets put into the topology table. I brought up this amazing slide here that will allow us to go in and take a look at how information gets put into the topology table. So the first thing that's going to happen is we're going to configure EIGRP on all the routers with the same autonomous system number and make sure all the IP addresses are functioning. And what will happen is the neighborly relationships will start being established with all that hello traffic that goes back and forth. So we got all the hellos going out every five seconds, everybody chatting with each other, saying, yeah, I'd like to be your neighbor. And they're going to start sharing information. What I want to look at is what will enter in to the topology table for Palestra 1 over here for this particular subnet, 20.10.0.0. The slash 16 mess. So this subnet's all the way over here. And how is that information going to get entered into Palestra 1's topology table when there are two different paths Palestra 1 could take? He could take serial 0 or serial 1. Now, just because both paths are there does not mean they'll both get entered into the topology table. What happens is Palestra 5, once he establishes those neighbor relationships, send the information off about 20.10.0.0 to Palestra 3 and Palestra 4. They pass that information along with their topology tables getting populated. And they'll follow the same pattern that Palestra 1 did, but I just want to focus on Palestra 1 here. I'm not worried about the details as far as 2, 3, and 4 go. So eventually... Through serial 0, a path gets to Palestra 1 to subnet 20.10.0.0. And it has a cost of 10 plus 5 plus 10. So its cost is 25. Now that's through serial 0. Through serial 1, it gets there and it has a path to 20.10.0.0. .0 .0 and its cost is 20. So it has to determine whether or not it's safe to put both paths in the topology table. Remember, this is just the next stop on the way to the routing table. Only the best cost path will get put into the routing table. So with this, he looks at the information. He says, OK, I've got a path to serial 1 with a cost of 20 to get to subnet 20.10.0.0. That's my best cost path. That is definitely going to go into my topology table. And that will be called my successor route. That successor route is the best cost path. Success, successor equals best. Now the big question is, is whether or not this path will be able to be entered into the topology table as a feasible successor. So this feasible successor equals backup. Now EIGRP wants to avoid loops, but it doesn't want to keep all the information that OSPF keeps in its topology table. So to avoid loops, or to guarantee EIGRP there are no loops, there's what's called a feasibility condition that a backup path has to meet before the router will put the information into its topology, topology table. And what that feasibility condition is, is a question of whether or not the next top router for this path, remember we're, we're evaluating the serial zero path right now, he has to look at his best cost path to get there is 20. He looks at Palestra 2 and sees what Palestra 2's cost to get to the same subnet would be. And Palestra's two, Palestra 2's cost is a cost of 15. Since Palestra 2 
has a cost of 15, and that's lower than Palestra 1's best cost path. Palestra 1 is guaranteed that when he sends something to Palestra 2 to go to subnet 20.10.0.0, that Palestra 2 is not going to send it back to him in hopes that it'll go around that direction. So since that cost path is lower, he'll go ahead and put that into the topology table as a feasible successor route because this path has met the feasibility condition. It's safe. Let's look at the numbers if it doesn't meet the feasibility condition. I've cleaned up this slide here. Now we're going to take a look at what's going to happen if we use different numbers for the paths. I cleaned up the slide too much. This is supposed to say Palestra 4 right here. So our subnet over here is still 20.10.0.0. Let's see what happens as this information gets shared with different costs now. Instead of 10, this is now 15. Instead of 5, that is now 10. So Palestra 5. We'll send this information down as it goes along the line. All the numbers get added up. So when it hits Palestra 1, he's going to see two paths. A serial 0 path to subnet 20.10.0.0. And it's going to have a cost of 35. And there's also going to be a serial 1 path to the same subnet with a cost of 20. So right off the bat, when he's getting this information, he's going to see his best cost path and go, OK, you're my best path. I like you. You're going to go into my topology table, and you will be my successor. So that's the best path to the destination. The second one, he's got to evaluate this cost of 35. He's looking at it, and he doesn't know. So what he's going to do is he's going to check Palestra 2's cost to get there. And Palestra 2's cost is 25. So what Palestra 1's thinking, he can't really see the big picture here. He's just thinking, hey, if Palestra 2 has a cost of 25 to get to network 20.10.0.0, my best cost path is 20. How do I know that Palestra 2's only way to get there is not going back through me? What he's thinking is that all of this over here may not exist and that this path has a cost of 5. So what he's looking at is, okay, Palestra 2, I'm getting information back here, and how do I know that if I send something to him, I'm not his path back to the destination? And he can't know for sure with the information that EIGRP looks at. So what he does is, even though all of that does exist over there, and I've cleaned up the slide again so you can see it, so this does exist. I mean, there is another path, but Palestra 1 can't be guaranteed that there's another path because this cost is 25. So he doesn't know for sure that Palestra 2 when he sends it there, isn't just going to send it right back around this way. So since he can't be guaranteed of that, not going to put that information into the topology table as a feasible successor, so there will not be a feasible successor to that destination. If this path were to go down, let's say this path goes down, and his favorite path is no longer available to him anymore, then he might sing a different tune. He's going to start using his dual diffusing update algorithm. And what he's doing is he's querying his other options now. And he's going to start asking around to find out if there is another path. And when asking around, he will find out that there is another path and he can still get there. And he'll put that in his topology table now as 20.10 with a cost of 35, and this will be his new successor. But it will not be used immediately. The problem with the feasible successor, if it, were, if it were in there, what would happen is if the successor path went down like it did, he would immediately use the other path without checking first. 
what Duel does, or without having it in there as a feasible successor, it causes him to check and make sure that there is a good path to the destination, then he'll use it. So it just gives him an extra step in there to guarantee he's not creating a routing loop. We're going to go in and take a look at a show command, the show EIGRP topology command, and view this information as the router would show it to you. Here we have the show IP EIGRP topology command in action. It shows the codes P passive that is good. Everything's up and running. And this is what we're looking at. This is the destination subnet. And again, this is the topology table, not the routing table. Only the successor route would enter into the routing table. So 172.16.22.0 is the destination subnet. To this destination subnet, there is one successor route, meaning one best cost path to the destination. The feasibility distance is 269.2856. This is an important number. This is the best cost path, or the best cost to the destination. And it says via 172.16.20.2. And notice this number right here matches the feasibility distance. So it's saying, okay, this number is the best cost path, or this is the best cost period to this destination subnet 172.16.20 or 22.0 through next hop router 20.2. What this is, is this is the next hop router's cost. So it throws the next hop router's cost in there. There is an additional route. This is the feasible successor. It's entered into the topology table because it meets that feasibility condition. Next top router 172.16.21.2 to destination subnet 22.0. It would cost 467.38176 to get to the 22.0 subnet through this next top router. And the reason it's entered into the routing table is because the next top router has a cost of 2169.856, which is lower than the successor cost of 2692856. So since this next top router has a lower cost than the best cost path that this router has to the destination, it's allowed to get entered in to the topology table as a feasible successor because this router knows that this router right here, 21.2, will not try to send the packet back through the Palestra 1 router to get to the destination. So he knows there's no routing loop. If this number right here was a 2769, this information would not get entered into the topology table. It would be ignored because the next top router has a higher cost than this router has to get to the destination. So again, what that's telling them is, hey, here's the next top router, B. It's possible that when A sends it to B that he might have to send it back through and that creates a routing loop when this number is higher than the best cost that A has. But again, since B's cost is lower, A knows if he sends it to B, there's no way he's going to send it back. He will send it on to the destination. And we can look at it in more examples here. 30.0, one successor. Feasibility distance, 2187456. And so it shows here... Okay, this is the cost to the destination, and the next top router has a 2281600. Pay attention to this number. When you see this number right here that I'm outlining over and over, what that's telling you is that this next top router is directly connected to the subnet. So here's router A, router B, directly connected to the subnet where that machine's on or whatever. So if A sends it to B, B doesn't have to send it to anybody else. It can send it right to the machine. Very important. 281600 means the next hop router is directly connected. And the last one on the bottom here, again, same thing. One successor to 90.0 through both different routers, 20.2 and 21.2. This is the best cost path. So this is the successor, one successor. 
this is the feasible successor right here because his cost is higher than the best cost path, but the next hop router has a lower cost than this cost. You can actually see here the next hop router is actually directly connected to the subnet. There's just a really slow link to the next hop router. So this scenario right here would play out something like this. You've got router A, router B, and the destination subnet right there. And the other way, there's probably a couple of routers, router C and router D. So A is actually choosing this path because this link is crawling slow. Maybe it's a 56K link or something like that. It's crawling slow, so it takes a lot longer to get there than it is to go over these faster multiple links to get to the destination subnet right here. So that's looking at this table. Very important to understand this information. And again, if you see that 281600, you know that the next top router is directly connected and there is no routing loop possible then. There's one other thing I wanted to talk about. That's why I cleaned up the slide and gave myself a little working room. Dual diffusing update algorithm. Let's take an example of the 30.0 subnet. So we've got Palestra 1 right here and another router, Palestra 2, which is directly connected to this destination subnet of 172.16.30.0. So he's got a path there and it has a cost of 2187456. That's his cost to get there. Now maybe there's another way to get there. But he's been ignoring that information. Maybe through router Palestra 3, Palestra 4, he's got another path to get there out of his Serial 1 interface. This is Serial 0. So Serial 1, he might have been getting information all along when the updates take place or during the initial update. And this cost must might be something that is... Uh, two, nine, three, six, seven, five, nine. I don't know. I'm just throwing some numbers up there. So it's a big number. And the next hop router, which is Palestra 3, has a cost to get to this destination subnet of two, eight, seven, six, three, two, one. So that is a number eight right there. So what's happening is Palestra 3 has a higher cost to get to the destination than Palestra 1 does. So what happens is Palestra 1 ignored this path. He said, that path might be a loop. Since I have a lower cost than Palestra 3, I can't be guaranteed that if I send him something, he's not going to send it back around to me. So he doesn't put it in the topology table. He has just one successor route and no feasible successor. This path does not meet the feasibility condition. So what happens when this goes down, Dual kicks in and takes over and starts querying the routers to make sure there's still an open path to the destination. So he basically explores this option that he had previously been ignoring. He finds out that it's a good path and he puts that in as the successor route. So dual allows the router to query for additional paths when the successor goes down and there is no feasible successor. Now we have talked about the EIGRP concepts, the three tables, the neighbor table. Again, that's where all his friends go in that he's going to exchange topology information with. The topology table, which keeps only successor and feasible successor routes. These feasible successor routes have to meet the feasibility condition. And again, that's to guarantee no loops. Loops are bad. No loops. The routing table, which the successor route gets entered into, how the routers go about finding their neighbors, the loop avoidance with the successor and feasible successor route, and dual, which kicks into gear if the successor route goes down and there is not a feasible successor route to take.